Next on call, how much vitamin D should you be taking? They've increased them for 50 to 70 year olds. And what does vitamin D do for the body? Funding for this program is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Television. And by... The South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, the Brookings Health System, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Post captioning for on call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System and Fishback Financial Corporation. There's the, the bell. And which was healthier, the yogurt and the bagel? I'm going to start by measuring the size of it. You could also add grilled chicken to this recipe. Whoa, 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 keep pushing. Pull red handle to open bag. Hello and welcome to On Call. I'm Tammy Watson. Tonight's show has been billed as covering vitamin D, the thyroid, and more. Well, what that more really is, is the endocrine system. Remember the endocrine system? For some of it, it was something last addressed in like a freshman science class, and that was the last time we really talked about it. Well, tonight our doctors are going to take us back to that topic and illuminate it with a new light, the glands and hormones that affect our mood and our metabolism and a host of other health concerns are at center stage in our show tonight. And with me in the studio, ready to answer your questions about vitamin D, the thyroid, and more, are Dr. Wael Eid and our medical editor, Dr. Rick Holm. You can call in with your questions about tonight's topic right now. Our phone number is 1-888-DOCTOR-ON-CALL. Again, that's 1-888-376-6225. And helping answer the phones tonight are volunteers from the South Dakota State University Pre-Professional Science Club. Dr. Holm, before you introduce our guest, give me the basics on the thyroid. What does this gland do for us? The thyroid is controlled by the brain. The brain directs it. When the thyroid's low, then it kicks it in the butt, and when it's going too fast, it says turn down. So it's a brain controlling the thyroid, and the thyroid is a hormone that really is the the, you know, that turns your speed of your whole metabolism faster or slower. Okay. And we can ask Dr. Ede uh, later to define it better, but it's one of those things that when it does burn out, and it bu burns out quite frequently, you just simply replace it. And it's one of those things that we just have to do and monitor for, uh, for those signs of low thyroid. It's an okay. interesting This will uh, be a good show. Plan. There's a lot to know about uh, okay. hormones. I'm pleased to introduce our guest for this evening, Dr. Wael Eid. Dr. Eid is with the Avera Endocrinology uh, Department in Sioux Falls. Welcome, Dr. Eid. Thank you very much for the call. So you, uh, you're from where originally? Originally from uh, uh, Egypt, Alexandria. In Alexandria, Egypt. Yeah. you know, the home of that great uh, library. Absolutely. And so they've replaced it with a new library, apparently. Which is another fascinating piece of uh, library, basically. It's a wonderful I, library we're proud to have. Yeah, they said that all of the books of the Mediterranean came to Alexandria for, you know, a thousand years or something Absolutely. like that. Absolutely. Actually, it was a, a UNICEF uh, project that uh, was a multinational to bring that library back to Alexandria. So it's a very good one. It's a great one. So, and then you, you, you uh, went to med school and trained in Egypt? Absolutely. So I did my uh, school in Egypt. I graduated from there. I did my uh, training there. I was an endocrinologist there and then uh, decided to go for more training. And that's, I think, where I decided to come to the United States. So you did some more training where? I did it at Baylor with MD Anderson back in Houston or down in Houston. Yeah, yeah, Baylor. That's a, it's a high, good high not, good program. And then you were practicing there for a while. And then I've been here for almost eleven years now. Now you've been in South Dakota for eleven for years. For eleven years, yes. So I enjoy the snow. What? Yeah, <laughs> you must. It's a lot like uh, Alexandria. Uh, uh, we don't have much snow there. But, uh, <laughs> you get used to it. 
<laughs> so, uh, in, a, in a word, what would you, how would you define the endocrine system? You know, uh, it's, it's a very interesting uh, system because basically, uh, I always say it's like a puzzle because it's a multiple glands that are connected by a network. And once you know how that network uh, works, you can kind of uh, uh, get to know that system more. But it's a different glands with the master gland being in the pituitary gland, like you just mentioned. And the pituitary gland is in the center of the brain. So that pituitary gland con controls most of the glands in the body. It controls your thyroid, your adrenal glands, and your, your uh, gonads, which is the ovaries and the testicles in the man and also your, uh, your uh, 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 parathyroid glands, which I think would be an interesting t t uh, talk today. Uh, so uh, the uh, other glands that I think is coming out lately is the fat. People do not sometimes understand that the fat or the adipose tissue is a, it's actually a, a very active endocrine uh, gland. It's, it's one of actually the biggest. I need to, uh, we're going to need to talk about that. Well, let's, uh, we'll talk about that. We need to get questions. And we're, we're going to talk about vitamin D as well as uh, maybe the parathyroid glands. Absolutely. We can talk about the thymus. We can talk about how the fat works as an endocrine gland. But we need questions. So do those. Uh, get on that phone. Give us a call. We'll talk about it right after this. Vitamin D is needed for normal absorption of calcium and phosphorus. It helps put these minerals into bones and teeth. This makes bones stronger and reduces your risk for bone fractures. Hypothyroidism is the term for an underactive thyroid. Several years back, On Call spoke to a patient with hypothyroidism to find out how this condition is treated. We're going to bring you her story again right now. Lindsay Myers has this report. Ruth Stanga works in healthcare, so she finds it important to get routine checkups. But what started out as a regular blood draw led to a diagnosis of hypothyroidism. I really didn't notice any symptoms. I work at the hospital, so I just had our routine lab, mm -hmm. lab work, wherein I usually get heart checks that I have them check, but this time I used a thyroid check, and it was, that's where we noticed it first. This diagnosis means that Ruth's thyroid doesn't produce enough of her thyroid hormone, so she takes a daily medication called Synthroid to supplement it. Just to start the medication and stay on that, and then I get checked once a year to make sure the levels are, the lab levels are normal, which they have been. So that once they got me regulated, they haven't changed the medication at all. She says looking back now, some symptoms that she was experiencing may have been caused by her thyroid disorder. I think um, some of the symptoms are tiredness, which I don't know, I was tired a lot, but I just contributed that to my lifestyle and my work and weight gain. Ruth's medication has helped her to feel better. She also does a regular exercise program to boost her energy and prevent bone loss. So I work, walk on the treadmill and I try and mow the lawn walking most of the time. And I have some weights that I do weight lifting with, my, with the hands. Ruth's sister was also diagnosed with hypothyroidism a few years before her. And that has helped Ruth to make sure her condition is on the right track. Probably compare notes to see if she's doing anything differently than I do. We kind of both have the same lifestyle, so. <laughs> Reporting for On Call, I'm Lindsay Myers. Doctors, I know we can start out, we can uh, talk about the thyroid, we can go back to the endocrine system real quick. I gave Ruth a call and she said she's still doing fine with managing her hypothyroidism, so that that's, bodes well for uh, dealing with that. Right, wouldn't you say, what, 90% of what we do is this kind of this thyroid that just kind of burns out in some people and you replace it with thyroid and that's about it? In most of the situations, and again, we have to remember that the commonest cause for the thyroid gland to slow down is autoimmune, which is very common. Almost. Autoimmune, it's sort of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. The Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is kind of the uh, uh, fancy name of it. Yeah, <laughs> in, in other words, you just, you, you go after your, you, you, you see it as an, an invader and your body uh, eats it up. Absolutely, yes, absolutely. And uh, the only problem with that diagnosis, it takes a long time for it to uh, evolve. Like Ruth was lucky that she was diagnosed. Actually, uh, uh, her sister having a hypothyroidism is, a, is a kind of one of the reasons we kind of check people for the thyroid because if you have any family member with thyroid problems, go and check yours too. Right. Because it takes long to cross from one, from a normal thyroid into a slow thyroid. It might take up to 13 years. So what is the most common symptom? Uh, like Ruth said, tiredness, fatigue, hair loss, uh, uh, dry skin, 
cold intolerance, all those symptoms are symptoms. Kind of about like being a South Dakota. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, I'm thinking <laughs> yes. that. That's me, yes. that's me. Yes. 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 <laughs> but uh, checking a, a level is very accurate. It's very right? simple, it's very accurate, and it is the most sensitive test we have. It's just so, a blood test? Yeah, it's just okay. a simple blood, blood test. test. Yeah. What, what about hyperthyroid, too much thyroid? Why does that occur? Uh, again, the commonest cause is autoimmune. So autoimmune system, it, it can attack the gland and produce one of, one of the other, either an overactive or an underactive. And when a person's thyroid goes too fast or is too active, what happens? Too much of a metabolism. Imagine yourself kind of running the marathon 24-7 with non-stop. Eventually you get tired, you get fatigued, you kind of get irritable, anxious, you lose weight even though you eat a lot, but still you lose weight. So and, and your nails get thin. Brittle and thin, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Hmm. So it's a very common uh, deal. You, that's one reason to go to the doctor okay. on a routine basis. Now, bef okay, and I wanted sorry, to make sure we said that you're an internist and an endocrinologist. Absolutely. I'm proud to be an internist. See, an internist endocrinologist, so we're happy to have you a combination guy. The, the testing for the thyroid, actually, uh, the test we use is called TSH, and that test is interesting. It can be used to uh, diagnose both, underactive and overactive. So it's a very valuable test. Yep. Okay. Now, I uh, want to go back to what you gentlemen were talking about before the, before the segment about the endocrine system. And we do have a graphic that you'll see in just a minute. We'll put that up on the screen. And yes, I think, uh, you know, freshman health class was probably the last time I talked about this. So give us a quick run through. What, what does the this... pineal gland. The pineal gland is the gland that basically controls the circadian rhythm and the sleeping uh, cycles in our body. We don't know much about it now except that it produces a hormone called melatonin and some people would basically uh, use that sometimes uh, for folks like me who travel a lot of overseas, they use that, that to kind of uh, bridge over the jet lag. So you and you use the uh, you use it then you like sometimes it. Yes, yes sometimes and the pituitary what the heck is that pituitary is the master of all the glands displayed in that graph so the pituitary gland basically control the thyroid control the adrenal gland control the uh, uh, ovaries and the testicles not the pancreas so much not the pancreas that much okay right. and so uh, TSH which you just mentioned for thyroid stimulating hormone which controls the thyroid really goes up when the thyroid is low. True. And drops low when the thyroid is high. Absolutely. Because it's the controller of the thyroid. Right. And all the system, all the endocrine glands, which is very important to understand, all the endocrine glands have a feedback mechanism. And that feedback mechanism, when the hormone gets low, the pituitary will kick back in, trying to produce, kind of make that gland work harder. How is it going to make that gland work harder? By producing too much of that hormone. Right which is a very useful test. Oh, it's a great test. Homeostasis is a word that we heard in biology in college. What is your, what is your balance of that word, homeostasis? What, what, what the heck is that? Which is perfectly what the, what the pituitary gland would, would basically produce. When the thyroid go, gland goes slow, the pituitary will secrete that hormone, TSH, to, to make the gland to work better. So the hormones would basically level off and be at the normal level. So, so it's leveling off. It's right. That, but, it's there is a, but there is a price for that. What is the price? The price for that when the TSH goes up, the gland would, ex would enlarge. So we'd have the goiter or the enlarged thyroid gland. Now there's a whole story about goiters, and this is a goiter belt in the country. Why does a goiter belt not occur anymore? What, why, what was this large goiter story that we see in Africa we don't see in the okay. U.S. anymore? True. In the past, uh, or in Africa, there used to be an iodine deficiency there. And the, the, the thyroid glands are made up of iodine. So if you are deficient in iodine, your thyroid gland will expand, trying to produce more and more from the thyroid hormones. And that's basically because of the iodine deficiency. We don't see that much now, uh, basically, because most, most of the salt we use is basically iodized. I, and the story of discovering that iodine is the cause of goiter is this amazing story where they they, they thought that that was the case for like a hundred years, but they would poison people with too much iodine to try to fix their problem until one guy realized that it was a low, low level of iodine and you got to start young and you put it in little kids. And uh, of course, cretins or uh, cretinism, which is a, a condition of low thyroid in children, causes a great deal of dementia and, and can uh, bring that into adulthood. And the uh, Kiwanis uh, in the international has endeavor to try to put iodized salt making uh, factors in or manufacturing in all of the world where particularly iodine deficiency occurs. Have you heard any of that? Um, uh, 
some, but again, with the with the with the uh, uh, salts being iodized now, uh, this is not now the commonest cause for the uh, glands to be slow. Right, there are other causes. So it's almost a forgotten illness in the U.S., but it's not in the rest of the world. Not yet, especially in Africa. Actually, there is a disease. Jacques Basidou is the uh, physician who discovered that in Europe. Uh, there is a, there is a specific disease, uh, goiter or enlarged thyroid, because of a deficiency of the iodine. Right. So uh, and thanks to Kiwanis's effort for for try to bring yeah. uh, help throughout the rest of the world. Well, let, get, should we go back to that uh, the picture? Um, sure, if you want to go back to yeah, the graph. Yeah, let's finish up the graph quickly up. Sure. a while. So, uh, the adrenaline, adrenal gland. So the adrenal gland, there is a hormone in the pituitary gland called ACTH. That ACTH controls the how much cortisol is being secreted by that adrenal gland. Now if the adrenal gland, I'm sorry for interrupting, those are the two glands sitting on top of my kidneys? Absolutely. Yeah. Adrenal, on top of the kidney. Uh, adrenal, that makes sense. adrenal. So adrenaline is one of the hormones that comes out of the adrenal gland, and noradrenaline. What are those two hormones? The uh, uh, adrenaline and noradrenaline are basically uh, like the uh, fight, the, the 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 fight hormones. The adrenaline is basically produced exclusively by the adrenal gland, but the noradrenaline is being produced also by the nervous system. So some of the nerve endings will produce noradrenaline, but the gla the adrenal glands itself. Uh, most of what it produces, almost 80%, is just adrenaline. The no fight or flight system and the, ad and the noradrenaline, which is, uh, or norepinephrine, is the thing that raises the blood pressure more than anything. Yes, and there's tumors that, that can make the uh, blood pressure go up just because Fe of too much adrenaline. A pheochromocytoma. Well, what about the pancreas? That's the c really the, the major hormone gland that right. we talk about a lot because uh, in uh, diabetes. Right. So basically, if you have the the pancreas has so many glands, it has an endocrine gland and an, another gland that, that produces the juice for uh, uh, for the for the food for digestion. Yeah, for that, digestion. That's exocrine. That's that's not hormone. Nothing it doesn't go do into the bloodstream. Us. Absolutely. Yes. So, yes. Uh, but the endocrine, what is the what does it make? Uh, it makes two hormones. One of them is the insulin, and the other one is called the glucagon, and they kind of balance each other. So the insulin would lower the sugar, and the glucagon would increase the sugar. And you can have a problem in either one. If you have too much insulin, your sugars would go, would go low. If you have too, uh, too little of insulin, you get diabetes. Yeah, and, and so here I am, a diabetic, taking my insulin. I get too much insulin, and I go too low, Absolutely. and my glucagons kick in to try to save the day, right? Right. Throws you all out of whack, right. and that's uh, one of the major problems for too high of a blood sugar, which is too much insulin, it gives you the kick of glucagon and it throws you out of whack. You think you're too low of insulin, but you're really too high. It's one of the schmoji effects of uh, diabetes. It makes it so darn complicated. And why we need you, Dr. <laughs> <laughs> why we need for you. That. Okay, so uh, what else about the endocrine glands? Uh, the, uh, the ovaries and the, and the uh, uh, testicles basically are the gonads uh, in, a, in, the, uh, in the female and in the male that basically control the uh, reproduction. Right, and really what we need for our teenagers is stop nads. <laughs> but, uh, but, you were but, waiting for that I, one. I, it came to me. I've never heard that joke before. So let's talk. Uh, what you, let's well, go questions, huh? Yeah, we've got questions, but real quick, I was, when you touched on diabetes, I, and Dr. Ede, you mentioned to me on the phone that you said sometimes with a patient you'll explain that you're a diabetes doctor because that is what endocrinology, those of us who are learning this, kind of what, what a lot of this is about. Okay, I think you gentlemen already kind of answered this question. Um, a caller from Deadwood, what diagnostic tests are used for hypothyroidism? Um, is synthetic thyroid replacement as, as good as the natural? Well, that's a great question, but there, I generally do a TSH, which we talked about from the t pituitary, and I do a free T4 because sometimes it's a combination. Do you do both as a rule? I do both, and again, for the simple reason is you really have to look into that axis, meaning that how the pituitary gland interacts with the thyroid gland itself, right. so I now, do both. Okay, now there's this big group of people who say, I can't take a levothyroxine or the uh, or a brand, a generic version of Synthroid, I must have the natural kind or I must have T3 kind or I need to have, you know, what's that whole story? What do you believe in that? You know, there are kind of two types of the thyroid hormone replacement, either the natural hormones, which people kind of liked in the past, or the synthetic ones, which, which we like. And basically, the natural hormones are desiccated thyroid hormones. It comes from, like, uh, 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 pigs and from animals. 
The problem with those products is that it has a lot of uh, uh, impurities in the way they have been kind of uh, manufactured. manufactured. That's why we get into troubles that it's hard for us to keep the results consistent. That's why we are kind of shying away from those natural and try to kind of go to the synthetic, which are very, uh, very well standardized. But now, how about the, th the, the T3 hormone replacement? Are there people who really absolutely have to have that? Interesting story. Normally, a, a normal thyroid gland would produce both, 80% from the T4 and 20% from the T3. All those hormones go to the level of the tissues and the level of the organs. All gets converted to T3. So when you use a synthroid or a levothyroxine, whether generic or brand or, leave or, or, or levoxyl, this is all T4. And you let your body decide how much it want to convert to the, to the active one. So it makes sense that the, it allows the body a buffer. Absolutely. You decide, yes. you decide yes. how much you want yes. to convert. Yes. All right. Um, am I interrupting? I've yeah, no, another, you are. Because, but are there certain people who need to have that cytomel? Uh, 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 in the past, they used the, the cytomel for depression, to augment depression. But luckily enough, we have way better medications now to use for depression rather than cytomel. So I would not recommend cytomel because it would really confuse the picture with the thyroid right. uh, hormones. Okay. Okay. Um, on the topic of synthroid, synthroid? Yeah. Um, caller from Yankton, 64 years old. She takes it on um, synthroid MCG daily, takes it on an empty stomach. How important is it that um, it has to be on an empty stomach, and what happens if she doesn't do that? Straightforward question. I just saw a lady today, uh, exactly the same problem. She has been taking the medicine as prescribed. The only problem is she takes the medicine with other food, and at the same time, she take it out of the bottle that it comes with. The, all the thyroid medicine, if you look at the bottle, it comes in a dark bottle because that medicine is a photosensitive. The light would affect the pill. It would make it less potent. So okay. uh, it's very important to follow those simple rules. You take it on an empty stomach because other medications would interfere with the absorption of that medicine. So you will not be getting the, 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 the expected good, ref, good uh, 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 result from that medicine. So it is, it's important. Now... Uh, you know, one other thing, it count, that runs counter to kind of what I've said to my patients for, let's see, 30 years, and that is, but what you've been doing, okay, I, I'm sorry that we didn't start you on an empty stomach, but you've been doing it all these years with breakfast at the same time, and I've been measuring your levels of TSH, and we've adjusted according to what you're doing. You're saying, no, because there's variable. Absolutely. Meal. So you prefer that the thyroid is replaced and I'm going to have to change my tune. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I usually say whatever is not broken, do not fix it. So yes. if she has been doing that for a long time and her yeah. numbers are steady, just stay the same. Stay the but same. if you see a lot of variability in the uh, TSH result, when it get becomes back to the variable, basis. then change what you're doing. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Okay, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Um, caller from Sioux Falls, is, a gentleman, is wondering about the long term effects of having the thymus gland irradiated to shrink it. Um, Born in 1938, his thymus gland was exposed to x-ray to shrink. Now, that was something that I was going to put on the graphic, and then I pulled it off. Yeah, and right. so thymus is a great organ. What is a thymus? Why did they irradiate it? And what does it matter? Thymus is kind of, a, actually, it, it, it's, we don't deal a lot with the thymus. It's an immune organ, basically. It doesn't produce too much hormones for us, and we don't deal with it on a daily basis. But the, 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 the question is very interesting because whenever you get any irradiation to the chest, if it, if it expands a little bit to involve the neck, any irradiation to the neck put that patient or that person at risk of having an underactive thyroid. Thyroid cells are very sensitive. Once you give it a lot of radiation, it slows down. Those folks with the cancer, when they get radiation to the neck, they get hypothyroidism. So I would check, I mean, I would really interested to see what his TSH looks like. And, and you don't worry about an irradiated thyroid, is what you, a thymus? Uh, not from my prospect. Right, and I think that basically that immune, it, maybe your immunological system is just a little bit less active. But I don't, I can't speak from a, a position of knowledge, really. That's just a Thymus kind of a... problems don't come in every day. They're big when you're a little <laughs> kid. We're really not sure what it does. And then it gets smaller as you get older. Okay. Something like the uh, tonsils. I mean, they, they, yeah. they are large when you're, uh, when you're a child. And yeah. then they kind of shrink as you, uh, as you grow. Okay. Real quick, back to the thyroid. Where are we talking about? In... Below the voice box. So it's a, like a bow tie. And it, and it gets small as it crosses below the voice box and it gets bigger. And I think, you know, I've looked at it a million ways, trying to feel it from behind, feeling it from the front. But I think the best, best way to examine it is really to look. And if you just watch a person and then have them swallow, 
The Yours thyroid. is not enlarged. Mine is not enlarged. No. <laughs> and you can see it sometimes come up and you can go, oh, you, we oh, should check the you... thyroid. Am I, am I not? Absolutely. What's your take on that? I usually go by exactly what you just said. Just have a good look at your, at your neck. Kind of take a good exposure there and swallow. If you see something rolling back and forth, that's what, that, that's what your thyroid and is. No, and it can be normal. But uh, I, I had a lady the other day. I felt her thyroid like I do routinely. You know, uh, uh, not big, no big. And I'm standing looking to her, and I saw her swallow, and I saw this, ooh, ooh, <laughs> ooh, a little bit bigger on the right than on the left. We should check it, and maybe we, if it's larger, let me feel that again. So that's an important thing. Look at it. Yeah. Well, I'm yeah. to totally going to go do that tonight. So yeah, you are. In my bathroom <laughs> mirror and swallow. Um, we're we're going to go to tape in just a minute here, but I'm going to dive into this question, and we might go long anyway. A question from a lady from Sioux Falls. I'd like to know more about the symptoms of thyroid disorder other than fatigue and weight gain. So if we can revisit that. What other symptoms? You know, again, the problem with the symptoms for underactive thyroid, it's a very nonspecific, meaning these symptoms can be because of the thyroid or can be because of so many other things, even the vitamin D that we'll talk about later today. This is one of the symptoms. So yeah, I, typically we say fatigue, uh, dry, uh, dry skin, uh, uh, hair loss, uh, failure to lose weight. You get people to do all kinds of activities, exercise, uh, dieting, and still they're not able to lose the weight. No, I, I, I agree. I, but but I, I think that the vast majority of all those, they have normal thyroid. You know, they come in, oh, I'm so tired, my hair is, yeah, I'm so tired. I'm, is my thyroid okay? And you check it, it's fine. At least you owe them the check. Yes, okay. that's right. I think that's important. What I do do is uh, find more hypo and hyperthyroid in my patients who present with atrial fib, an irregular heart rhythm. And sometimes you see it with low. But, most, but mostly we, we need to rule out hyper, excessive thyroid. One, one other common thing is, you know, the, if you look at the range for the test that we order, the TSH, which is considered the best test, mm -hmm. that test has a very wide range. So you'll see people having symptoms, but still, they are, they, I mean, they, they were told that, no, your symptoms are not because of the thyroid. It's very important to kind of take the whole context of how the thyroid with the family history, with the, with the trend in that TSH. If you had a TSH in the past that was maybe one, and now your TSH is four, even though one is normal and four is normal, but the trend itself that you see that TSH shifting up, that might be a sign that your yep. thyroid is slowing down. Yep. So you have to take the whole picture. Check it again in three months. Okay. Yes. Yeah. We're going back to tape now, and we haven't quite covered vitamin D yet, but we're coming up on it because if this is a point we want to make um, clearful, clearful, excuse me. Um, our next story will talk about research into the role of vitamin D in the human body. It's ongoing. We know some things, but not everything, about the impact of vitamin D in our diets. So On Call met with a scientist who has specialized in, among other things, vitamin D-focused research to learn more about this. In 1997, Dr. Bonnie Specker served on a panel of 10 scientists charged with reviewing existing research into vitamin D. This panel was responsible for reporting back to the national organization that sets the recommended daily allowance for vitamin consumption. The Institute of Medicine at the National Academy of Sciences is the organization that's responsible for setting the dietary recommendations. But in 97, they formed panels for different sets of nutrients. And the purpose of those panels was to review the scientific evidence and compile it and then publish it so that you could see how the recommendations were actually being made. Vitamin intake recommendations continue to be updated. And right now, the amounts for vitamin D in the diet have been set at 600 units a day for people between the ages of 50 and 70 and 800 units per day for people over the age of 70. There are quite a few studies out there and quite a few individuals who are promoting higher levels of vitamin D for things like the prevention of cancer asthma, improved immune function, prevention of diabetes. But they, the committee did not feel that there have been sufficient studies to base recommendations on those outcomes. Specker is an epidemiologist. She has focused her scientific efforts into a field of research that looks at public health and issues of disease at the broad population level. And she understands that research into the field of human nutrition needs rigorous scientific methods, something not always seen in news stories touting the possible health benefits of vitamin D. 
There are some preliminary studies that indicate that it may be important for a lot of other diseases other than just bone-related effects. Um, but the, the studies that have been done are not of the quality that the committee felt warrants an increase in the recommendations above what they, they recommended. Um, a lot of it has to do with the type of studies and which studies are powerful in terms of determining cause and effect. Vitamin D is both a nutrient we eat and a hormone our bodies make. Few foods are naturally rich in vitamin D, so the biggest dietary sources are fortified foods and vitamin supplements. Yeah. Thank you for joining us tonight. We're talking about vitamin D, the thyroid, and more. Here in the studio, ready to answer your questions, are Dr. Wael Eid and the on-call medical editor, Dr. Rick Holm. You can call in right now with your questions about our topic. Our phone number is 1-888-DOCTOR-ON-CALL. Again, that's one 888-376-6225. Doctors, I was going to say let's follow up with how much vitamin D we should be consuming and we've got a question that follows here. Let's do it. Um, a gentleman from Sioux Falls, age 69, was a smoker, quit several years ago, has osteoporosis, takes 600 milligrams of calcium, 400 uh, vitamin, milligrams of vitamin D in the morning, 400 at noon, 400 in the evening. Is this too much? Well, let's talk about the calcium first. Are you supplementing people? I know, I know there's a lot of controversy about calcium and there's recently been stuff about calcium being harmful to the arteries in that big woman study. True. Do you, are you pushing calcium on people? I not? don't use that much. What I usually do is like a 500 milligram from the supplements plus whatever in their, in their kind of diet would be enough to get them up to the 800 or 1200 that they would need in a, in a day. I don't give beyond the 500 in most of the situations unless they don't take a dairy product. So then you will need to give more from the supplements. Right, now a lot of people have osteoporosis, quote unquote, by the uh, bone density studies, but the, the bone density studies are not specific enough to say, oh, this was a calcium deficiency, or oh, maybe this is osteomalacia, which is actually the, the, the thin bones resulting from vitamin D deficiency. Am I right? True. So we can't tell on the bone studies, and it may be they're vitamin no. D deficient. No, you cannot. So uh, do you believe in doing vitamin D levels in, in people? Uh, you know, I, if you talk to me, yes, I, I have to check vitamin D on anybody with osteoporosis, especially if he's a male, because remember, it's easier for a woman to get an osteoporosis rather than a man. If a man gets an osteoporosis, you really have to ask why. Right, now women will get it because why? Why do women get Just it? Just because of the uh, uh, loss of the female hormones, the uh, menopause. Uh -huh. But men, uh, typically the level of uh, hormone deficiencies in the men, the male hormone deficiency is not as common as in the woman. Now let's say a person has an, uh, the right amount of calcium in their diet, which uh, some say that it, as a rule, most Americans, except for not, uh, nine to 18 year old girls, mm -hmm. have enough calcium in their regular diet. True. And you've got enough D, and a lot of people don't have enough D, so but let's just say we had enough D and we had enough calcium, which it doesn't take a lot. What is the most powerful um, a cause of strong bones uh, on top of those two, two entities? You know, usually the lifestyle is very important. So the, the exercise, and again, the weight-bearing exercise is the, is the main one we talk about. The, the swimming or, or just being kind of on the treadmill the, 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 or, or on the bike, it doesn't help. But you really have to kind of hit those bones hard so they can get... Uh, kind and of I didn't pay you to say that, right? I didn't <laughs> no, you did not. You did I not. did not you say did not. anything about this before That's he came so on. No. That's it. If you're doing the right thing with vitamin D and you're and getting enough calcium, which you, most of us do in our diet, we got to exercise to strengthen Absolutely. those bones. Absolutely. Now, what about all of this about Fosamax and all of these drugs that can um, uh, adjunct uh, the bone strength? Uh, my comment is, well, you better darn well be sure that your vitamin D in, in right. level is right and you're exercising right really. first, right? Right, right? But what is your take the, on the, those, the, right? the best test, like, what, like we just said, the best test for, to test whether you have an osteoporosis or not is basically look at that bone density. If your bone, if your bone density is too low, you, you cannot just risk uh, uh, going without those medicines. So those medicines are very helpful and they have proven basically to, imp to prevent fractures. So uh, that's why, as a physicians, when we get those osteoporosis, we really need to treat. And to treat, the lifestyle is very important, the vitamin D, the calcium is very important, but those medicines are important too. And remember, we use them for five years or for a little bit more, and then we can use a, what you call a drug holiday. A drug holiday, basically, after a few years of using those medicines, you just stop, give the, give the body kind of a, a break to uh, recover, and then you can reassess at that time. 
And so what Dr. Ede has just done is to present the standard uh, and, and what is scientifically solid presentation about Fosamax and those drugs. Personally, and I'm kind of off the, mm -hmm. the standard here, uh, I, I'm worried about Fosamax and all of those drugs because after five years they find that there's increased fractures and you, you had to stop them. And, and I'm thinking, in reality, we're not sure what we're doing with them and I'm nervous about it. The problem is we don't have anything better. Meaning that if you do the bone density and the bone density is, is, is basically too low and then you give the medicine and it gets better, that's, 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 that's okay. I, I, I think the, 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 the bottom line is we have to be very selective in who uses the medicine, who has the true osteoporosis, why do you have osteoporosis uh, if it's just because of the uh, hormonal loss or there's something else going yeah. on. Maybe, 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 maybe there's a cancer right. there that well, you need to kind of... There's a new drug out that, that's, uh, that's uh, the, uh, the, the, the medicine. Cholea. Yes. It's, what, it's, it's, what's, it, what's the name? Well, it, it, you explain what that drug uh, is. Basically, this is one of the new technology that we're using. It's a monoclonal antibodies. It kind of deals with the immune system and how it prevents the bone loss. Okay. There's, uh, uh, I have a, a, a close friend, uh, partner, uh, who, who believes that uh, we've got to be very careful about those, uh, those particular drugs. They're very powerful and helpful for people who have uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and immunological diseases, but are, mm -hmm. we, are we wandering into a field where it's, uh, we should be very careful? I am, I am, you know, and that's one of the things about the, the Fosamax and similars or the, uh, even the uh, other drugs is those drugs have been there for a long time, so we know more about it. That's why I'm a little bit leery in using one of those newer agents till you use the older ones that you know exactly what their safety profile look like and, and, and stuff like and, that. And the newer agents are not I, I, I would cheap. Need, right, they are not cheap. Actually, none of them is cheap. I mean, they are pretty spendy drugs, but if you need them, you need them. But yeah. uh, you don't go to the, to the latest unless you fail the, the, the very simple ones. Yes. Okay. I got a stack of questions, so we're going to right, dive questions. in and do lightning round here. A uh, caller from Watertown, age 44, has a 15-year-old daughter. My daughter's 15, and one month ago, her TSH measured 33 and iron 4. Those are blood tests, correct? Mm -hmm. She was put on iron pills and synthroid thyroxine, and I want to know if there's more we should be doing, or should we see a specialist? Also, is this something she will have to live with for the rest of her life? Um, is you, what might have caused and, this? And, um, she's she's got low th iron because she's bleeding because she's a woman and she's not been eating correctly. And iron supplements going to probably be enough, but you want to make sure she's not bleeding from her colon or bowel or Some somewhere kind of else. Thing. And you, that needs to be monitored. And the, and the thyroid replacement is is exactly what's needed. And I don't think necessarily need to be if if the doctor who's taking care of him is a good generalist should be able to do it. Absolutely, absolutely. The one, the one other uh, kind of uh, problem that we see uh, not infrequently here uh, is something called the celiac disease. And basically, uh, a thyroid disease is an autoimmune disease. And on the same theme of autoimmune problems, uh, we have seen young girls with celiac disease. Uh, that disease is very easy to treat once you make the diagnosis. And in the past, it used to be like five to 10 years before you, you get a, a, a case diagnosed. So uh, with, with her being iron deficient, if she, if she doesn't yes. have, a, if she doesn't have a, a, a menstrual problems, I would check her for celiac disease for one simple thing is the iron absorption happens at that part that gets affected by the celiac disease. Okay. Actually, okay. So yeah. good to have you here to say that because <laughs> no, I didn't bring it up and that's exactly it, right. That's a, we do, we yeah, do have it. And yeah. one patient that I had presented with iron deficiency, that's what he presented. Yeah, I remember in the ACP meeting a few years ago, we yeah. had one of those, yeah. yeah. Well, I didn't think we'd get to it, but we have a question from here on. Um, basically, they're looking, doesn't, uh, a lady doesn't have the internet, but she wants to get more information about celiac disease. Now, I'd say go to the public library, tell the librarian that's what you're looking for. Dr. Holm, you'd probably say call a clinic. And you go to see your doctor and talk to your doctor. Uh, you know, if you if you're go to the high V dietitian, she'll help you through this. The high V dietitian is available and is a great access uh, person for you. So, um, you know, any other particular thoughts? The library should have some good information. But it's an interesting disease where you don't absorb correctly. It's malabsorption and it's treated by going on a gluten-free diet. Free diet. And okay. it's an autoimmune, so it's a... Uh, it's a very interesting disease. It is an interesting disease. It's okay. interesting. Simple, yeah. simple, simple treatment, but uh, you have to make the diagnosis. Yeah. Okay. And it's a blood test. Simple blood, blood test. Simple blood test, ah. yeah. All right. Um, switching gears back to the thyroid. Uh, female caller, age 76, from Sioux Falls, 
X-rays at the dentist, is there risk of being exposed to high amounts of radiation that can affect the thyroid when they're doing <laughs> dental X-rays? No. No. no, usually, typically, we say the uh, uh, radiation that would uh, kind of slow down the thyroid gland is a big dose radiation, meaning that the one used for cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the past, uh, they used to treat uh, tonsils. Uh, With big, radiation, yes. Oh, yeah. really? <laughs> wow. Big tonsils and acne. Acne, they used to, they used to treat with radiation. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is in the 50s That's, or 60s. Yeah. Not that long ago. 50s or 60s. Uh, luckily enough, we don't do that. But when we yeah. see those folks now and they give us that history, this is just another indication to check for the TSH. You but know, the whole country was radiation crazy. And there were hip, hipsters who were, who were selling radiation, uh, you know, right and left. I mean, and pretending that they had radiation in their pills. Look, I don't want to go there. That's a, that's a show we got to do. Oh, that, it's that's awful. <laughs> okay. <laughs> What's been done? Um, okay, back to the phone calls. Uh, caller from Brookings, age 58, concerned with nodules. Um, given low dose of synthroid for hypothyroidism, can dosage be risen, be, uh, be increased? Um, well, what about thyroid nodules? And do what? you see low thyroid in people who have thyroid nodules? Absolutely, yeah. And remember, if 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 you go back to that uh, topic we had earlier, is if you have a high TSH, that TSH is going to stimulate the gland to grow. When the gland grows, it goes into lumps and nodules. But the 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 one uh, recommendation for this gentleman is uh, anybody with a thyroid nodule, he need to have a thyroid ultrasound done. Want to make sure that uh, it isn't a malignancy, right? Oh, okay. A thyroid ultrasound. It's a simple test. You do it back at at uh, home, and if it shows any nodules, the radiologist will be able to tell whether it uh, needs further workup, whether it needs biopsy or not. Yep. If it does need biopsy, then he can go up on the uh, dose if, as long as the test allows that. Cysts okay. are fine. Nodules could be cancer. No, not all of them are cancerous, so and it's certainly well easily treated. Uh, thyroid cancer. Absolutely, yes. Nowadays it's better as long as you find about it early. Don't wait too long before you can uh, work up your th thyroid nodules. What about the radiation at Chernobyl and all of the radiation exposure dangers that people talk about if there was an atomic war, you know, a, a nuclear war? Unfortunately, Did I say nuclear correct? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, it is a reality. It is a reality. The, the, the one of the known risk factors for thyroid cancer exposure to <coughs> nuclear radiation. Whether it's in, uh, whether whether it was uh, back with the, with that leak that happened close to Russia or whether anywhere, I mean, those who work close to a nuclear facility with any leak, that's one of the risks for thyroid cancer. And it's the big, and that's major cancer that you have from the radiation exposure. But it isn't the biggest danger in the world. I mean, it's well treated if you have that exposure. Pick it up early because again, we have a cutoff of 45. If you pick it up before the age of 45, your stage is still stage one, even if you have lymph nodes. But the longer you wait, the more problems you will have. Okay. Interestingly enough, I know a young lady who recently had surgery for thyroid cancer and a very graceful, tiny incision uh, on the neckline. I think that's going to heal totally without a scar. So I don't know how complicated the surgery is, but... Um. It's nice to... Ca uh, thyroid cancer is generally caught early as opposed to ovarian cancer, which is ca caught generally late, or brain tumors or pancreatic uh, tumors. So uh, pa thyroid cancer is much, much easier to diagnose. It's right out there. You kind of see it mm -hmm. when it's coming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and unfortunately, there are other cancers. We're going to have an ovarian cancer show next week, which will be great. Almost as good as this one. I mean. <laughs> but, uh, so, uh, but this is easier to catch. Um, on the topic of radiation, uh, caller age 74, lady received radioactive iodine at age 17. Um, quote, non-tender multinodularity in region of thyroid on her report to the clinic, wondering what causes it and if something should be done for so it. So she has that tenderness now? And um, she had the radioactive iodine before? Um, I, she had the iodine at age 17 and she's 74 now and... Has this um, tenderness now? Yeah. What do you think? You know, oh, yeah. uh, uh, Radioactive iodine is one of the one of the problems for it. Again, it's 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 not very common, but we have seen it uh, at least quite few. Uh, if she had I-131 or radioactive iodine, thyroid ultrasound is necessary. And if any of these lumps or nodules show any signs of uh, that that we don't feel comfortable with, we do biopsy those. Do you think a simple needle biopsy by an endocrinologist? That's like what you, you typically do in the office. Yeah. All right, and that's simple pretty and easy. pretty good. Simple, simple and easy. easy, relatively inexpensive. Uh, kind of, yeah. Okay. Kind of. <laughs> well, now, I, um, I know we were, we were going to touch on this, and I'm not sure if now is the time, but before the show, um, Dr. Ede was talking about a study 
And I don't yeah, know if you gentlemen want to discuss you that. Know, and again, it goes back to the vitamin D, which I have very uh, uh, much interest in it. Uh, vitamin D is very important for the muscles, like we talked about. And um, uh, there is a class of medicine called statins, which is a medicine we use for treating high cholesterol. Uh, there's a lot of folks who use that medicine and they, they get a lot of muscle aches, pains, and cramps. It's interesting that some of those have problems with vitamin D deficiency. So what we have now is a, a study through Avera that would basically uh, test how that vitamin D look, levels in those patients look like. And if we give them vitamin D, is that going to make their symptoms get better or not? So uh, if anybody has kind of the, those kind of pains or aches uh, and is using statin, uh, it would be great if we can uh, right. get him in So let's say I have a patient, uh, one of these p people that are watching couldn't take stents because they ached in pain. Could they call you and get involved with uh, the study? Uh, actually, no. We want those who are already using the medicine. Okay. But if, 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 he, if he had aches and pains in the past because of the statin, I would suggest he go and get his, uh, his or her level checked with the vitamin D. Or check your vitamin D. Absolutely. Because if it is low, that might be a simple fix. We're just learning more and more about <laughs> this. And if you, if you contact on call with your contact information, we'll route that to Dr. Eid, so we'll, we'll hook you up. Um, back to the questions about vitamin D. Caller from Sioux Falls, my doctor says I need more vitamin D because I don't get enough sun. What kind of vitamin D do I need to be taking? There's more than one kind. Uh, the, but the kind that I generally use, and most everybody uses, is the, the D3. And it's the capsule I prefer over the tablet. And I generally recommend 2,000. And I'm recommending, I, and the, and the uh, Institute of Medicine says everybody can take a supplement that's reasonable and, and appropriate, particularly if you're in South Dakota and you're living in January in South Dakota and you're not getting enough sun. I mean, who's had enough sun? And uh, I like to say 2,000. What do you say? I would agree with that as long as uh, that uh, person or uh, uh, that patient doesn't have problems with any other health problems, meaning that there are certain diseases that would require much more vitamin D than the 2,000 or the 4,000. Those with the liver disease, with the kidney disease, uh, those would need much more or higher amounts of vitamin D. Okay. So uh, levels are good to get in those people. Levels, I use it a lot, and I think it's very helpful. And uh, we are lucky now to have good uh, labs that would run those accurate tests and for you. I think they're about $80 for a test or something like that. Uh, right? Or even less, or even less. Okay. Now, there are certain groups of people that are at, more, at higher risk of having low vitamin D. Who, who would that be? Uh, uh, anybody with a liver disease, a uh, kidney problem, uh, uh, those who had a surgery, specifically the gastric bypass. You know, now we have a lot of uh, weight loss procedures, whether lab banding or gastric bypass. The vitamin D deficiency is much more common after a gastric bypass than with the lab banding. But I mean, uh, typically. I see it in obese people more than uh, people who are very heavy often are low in vitamin D. True, true. And that's because basically uh, those obese people do kind of retain that, fa that vitamin D within their fat because vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin. So the heavier you are, the more vitamin D you will get stuck in your body that will not be available for you to use. But after the gastric bypass, you bypass that segment that you absorb the calcium and the vitamin D from. That's why anybody with a gastric bypass, I would recommend he gets the vitamin D level checked. Well, and the Institute of Medicine also said this is a geriatric disease and that the elderly do not get enough as a rule and would like higher doses of vitamin D replacement for people who are elderly. What is elderly, Dr. E? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm checking this people. This is a debatable. <laughs> I am checking, checking people 60 years of age and older, and of course I'm there. This is a middle age. Yeah. <laughs> am I, ask me if I'm taking supplement. Uh, I think you should. I am. Yeah. Are you? Yeah. I am. Uh-huh. I, ta I, I, I take the maximum allowable by the IOA, which, the is, IOA, which is 4,000. Yeah, I'm which taking 2,000, but yeah. my levels are about 35 right now. Yeah. Okay, yeah. but I, could, I can go overboard on taking vitamin D supplements, You don't right? want to take more than 10,000. Uh, 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 remember, the heavier you are, the more vitamin D you would need. So the, the lighter you are, the less vitamin D you need because, again, if, if you are on the heavy side, that vitamin D is going to go to the fat stores. If you are on the lighter side, there is not much fat there. So I would go between the 2,000 to 4,000 depending on how your body frame and how your body weight looks like. For all? Adults. Uh, for all adults. Okay. Well, it's, we're getting close to wrap up time. Dr. Eid, we'll give you a, a soapbox for about 40 seconds yeah, here. What, what do you want to, everybody to remember? Uh, you know, uh, we talked about the thyroid, we talked about the vitamin D. The one little hormone that I think will, uh, will, uh, will kind of uh, give it uh, less than a second here or, or a few seconds is the parathyroid hormone. Whenever we see too low vitamin D levels, I think we have to check the parathyroid hormone. 
It's another top, uh, another kind of problem for another day maybe, but the parathyroid hormone is another interesting hormone that feedback with the vitamin D. So a parathyroid hormone, if it is high, refer to an endocrinologist. And my take home is that we need to exercise every day for our bone health. That's more than almost anything we can do. And I've got a new program. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, the 2M program, Move by Muscles. We want everybody to do a mile a day if you physically can. And it's a pretty easy deal. So I'm asking you all to think about this, and I'm going to ask again, 2M, Move Muscles. It's the thing to do. Thanks okay. so much for Thank joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you very much, Tim. Gentlemen, thanks so much. Stay tuned. We'll be right back after this break with the Homespun Perspective and what's new in medical science. Looking for reliable healthcare information online? You can start with a resources link at the OnCall website. From there, you can access a variety of accurate and dependable information sources, including the South Dakota State Department of Health and Medline Plus. Jump on the bad wagon is a political phrase started in the mid-1800s when a circus clown turned politician used his musical bandwagon for political rallies. As he passed through different towns, it happened that local politicians found seats on that bandwagon wishing to share in his popularity. As the political use of bandwagon spread, the phrase jump on the bandwagon came to refer to opportunists who support popular ideas without proof of value. What proof do we have of the value of taking calcium and vitamin D? Or have we all jumped on a bandwagon? Recently, the Institute of Medicine, the IOM, gathered a committee of scientists and experts to define what is scientifically proven about calcium and vitamin D. After extensive hearings and study, they said, there is solid proof that low levels of vitamin D are associated with poor bone health. We don't have enough evidence yet to say conclusively that vitamin D deficiency affects cardiovascular health or causes hypertension, diabetes, falls, colon cancer, and psychiatric illnesses. But the experts didn't deny it. They just said more studies are needed. With regard to dietary calcium, the IOM concluded that most people in the U.S. and Canada get enough calcium daily, except for girls aged 9 to 18. They also discovered that significant numbers of postmenopausal women are taking too much calcium. Vitamin D is, is more complicated because levels are quite unpredictable. Although they're commonly low in the elderly, in people with dark skin, though obese, people living in institutions, e even though multiple experts have advised that levels are too low when less than 30 to 50 nanograms per milliliter, the conservative IOM declared that levels below 20 are deficient. The IOM did advise supplementation for all people one year of age or older, stating that for adults taking up to 4,000 units is safe and advised not to take more than 10,000 daily. Take home message. I encourage calcium supplements for 9 to 18 year old girls, but not for adults. I also like to measure vitamin D levels, especially in people with dark pigment, obesity, high osteoporosis risk, those institutionalized, or in persons older than 60. And for bone health, I strongly recommend, along with exercise program, all adults should take daily something like two to 4,000 units of vitamin D. That's not just jumping on a bandwagon. We'll be right back. In our medical news tonight, it may be cold outside, but that's no consolation for women dealing with menopausal hot flashes. New research might be of interest for these women, however. Scientists studied a group of 205 women dealing with hot flashes during an eight-week randomized trial. Some women received an antidepressant called isaltopram, I, if I pronounce that. Escitalopram. Escitalopram. Lexapro is one of the brand names of this medication. And some women received a placebo. Researchers at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine who conducted the study found that while the placebo group saw a 33% decrease in their number of daily hot flashes, the group taking the antidepressant 
saw a 47 percent decrease. So that's 33 and 47. That's a, the 47 is about half as many hot flashes. The scientists who conducted this study say that because hormonal treatments for hot flashes, taking estrogen or progestin, can lead to health risks, the off-label use of antidepressants might be an option to consider for some women. And that's all that we have for this week. Remember, On Call is rebroadcast on SDPB Digital Channel 2, Mondays at 11, Wednesdays at 4 p.m. Um, the questions we didn't get to tonight, we'll post on our website. And again, thanks to our guests, Dr. Weil Eid and our medical editor, Dr. Rick Holm. Thanks to our phone volunteers and thanks to you for watching and calling in. Have a good evening. Funding for this program is provided in part by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Television. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, the Brookings Health System, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Post captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. To learn more about life and health, you can order your copy of The Picture of Health, a beautiful book containing insightful essays and evocative images by on-call medical editor Dr. Rick Holm and Dr. Judith Peterson. This book, containing health care advice, stories of medical history, and meditations on healing, can now be yours for $17 at the South Dakota Ag Heritage Museum. Call 1-877-227-0015. 15 to order. This offer is made by Ag Bio Communications at South Dakota State University.